Hello, and welcome to Mickeyology, where we take Disney movies a little too seriously. I'm Austin Rathall, and in the past, I've made two types of videos. Videos about when and where certain Disney movies take place, and videos comparing certain Disney movies to the books on which they're based. However, there are some movies that you guys ask me to analyze that don't fit into either category, including today's film, Disney and Pixar's Cars. Cars takes place in a fantasy car world, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about when and where it fits in real world history. It's not based on a book either. Nevertheless, Cars is a very historical film. In fact, if you took the various vehicles, places, and events of the movie and learned the true history behind each one and arranged those events on a timeline, you'd get a whole new story. A true story about the evolution of America's cars, America's roads, and Americans themselves. So today, we're telling that story. It's a story that begins in the earliest days of the automobile, leads right into the making of Pixar's beloved film, and it's all centered on a road called Route 66. Morning, tow truck. Good morning, Stanley. The story begins back in 1902. An invention called the automobile had just hit the market, and automakers like the Stanley Brothers were determined to dominate that market. While their rivals offered electric or petrol-powered cars, the Stanleys bet on steam. They founded the Stanley Motor Carriage Company in Massachusetts and began producing hundreds of shiny, stylish motor cars. Sleek as they were, Stanley steamers took 20 minutes to start, were hard to control, and were prone to explosions. A steam-powered car might seem like a funny idea nowadays, but no one was laughing in 1906 when a Stanley zoomed down a Florida beach at 127.66 miles per hour, setting a new land speed record. We might still be driving Stanley steamers today if the Stanley's rival, the Ford Automobile Company, hadn't released a new car in 1908. Ford's car was cheap, reliable, and customizable, and it took the U.S. by storm. Her official name was the Model T, but drivers nicknamed her the Tin Lizzie. While the Stanleys were making expensive steamers by hand, Ford was producing affordable Tin Lizzies on an assembly line. By the mid-1920s, millions of new tin lizzies were hitting the road every year, and the Stanleys just couldn't compete. Stanley Motor Carriage Company shut down in 1924. The Stanley Steamer and the Model T might seem like enemies, but not in Pixar's world. In Cars, we meet an old Model T named Lizzie, who married a steam car named Stanley, founder of Radiator Springs. While Stanley has passed away, his loving wife has fond memories of cruising alongside her beloved steamer in days gone by. Oh, Stanley. I wish you could see this. Where are you? I can't even find you on my GPS. I'm in this little town called Radiator Springs. You know Route 66? It's still here! Yeah, that's great, kid. All the people buying Model Ts in the 20s needed roads on which to drive them. So in 1921, Congress passed the Federal Highway Act, ordering the states to build a new network of highways. Every road in the new system would have a number. Even numbers for roads running east to west, and odd numbers for roads running north to south, and multiples of 10 would designate major highways. Therefore, the new highway that would run east to west from Chicago to LA would be called Route 60. However, People in Kentucky and Virginia were already building a local road that they planned on calling Route 60. When the authorities asked them to pick a different number, they refused. After months of arguing, U.S. officials finally surrendered. The Virginians could call their road Route 60. They'd call the National Highway Route 66. In 1926, federal and state officials dotted the last I's and crossed the last T's to make their new highway official. Now all they had to do was pave it. Hey, listen, listen, if anybody asks you, we was out smashing mailboxes, okay? What? Now, the government wasn't just planning highways back then, they were also enforcing prohibition, which made alcohol illegal nationwide. 
but some boys down south refused to let the government keep them from their whiskey. These were bootleggers, men who specialized in making, selling, and shipping alcohol on the black market. Transporting booze wasn't easy with local cops on the lookout though, so bootleggers needed a new type of car. One ordinary enough to avoid attention, but fast enough to outrun the police if necessary. So these rum runners created stock cars. Cars made from standard parts but with souped up engines capable of outracing police cruisers. Bootleggers became expert stock car drivers, able to maneuver through a winding one-laid road at top speed at night without using headlights. In 1933, the 21st Amendment ended prohibition, but bootleggers had found another way to use their skills. Instead of racing the police through the backcountry in the dark, they could race other drivers around a track in daylight. Soon, stock car racing went from criminal activity to spectator sport. Honey, please. Hello. Welcome to Radiator Springs, gateway to Ornament Valley, legendary for its quality service and friendly hospitality. How can we help you? When drought struck the Midwest in the 30s, many Americans headed to California, hoping to find work out west. To get there, they took the brand new road that wound clear across the country while avoiding the bad weather areas other highways passed through. While the drought was bad for farmers, it was great for the towns along Route 66 because it sent plenty of customers their way. Travelers could visit new filling stations in towns like Glen Rio and Shamrock, they could shop at trading posts in Lupton and Peach Springs, and they could sleep at motels in places like Tucumcari and Seligman. Not all travelers were welcome at places like these, though. Many towns that welcomed white customers turned African American customers away, making the journey more grueling for black families. There's a reason Sarge is so patriotic. Jeeps like him were literally built to serve in World War II. When the war broke out, hundreds of Americans shipped out to Europe and Asia, and many of them were assigned to get behind the wheels of these new army vehicles called Jeeps and drive them into battle. George C. Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, called the Jeep America's greatest contribution to modern warfare. One Jeep, called Old Faithful, even received the Purple Heart after she was injured in the Battle of Guadalcanal. Yes, really. Sarge would be proud. You're the Hudson Hornet! Wait over it flows, like I told you. Of course, I, I can't believe I didn't see it before. You're the fabulous Hudson Hornet! Do you still hold the record for most wins in a single season? Oh, we got a tour. In 1948, a mechanic named Bill France founded NASCAR. NASCAR took stock car racing nationwide, and in 1951, it held its first race in California. There, a sleek new car called the fabulous Hudson Hornet entered the competition. The Hornet won the season opening race that year and then kept on winning. From 1951 to 1955, Hudson Hornets won the season opening race four times, took home three championship titles, and in 1952, they had a 79.4 winning percentage. The winningest Hudson driver of all time was Herb Thomas, whose winning percentage is still the highest in NASCAR history. Thomas was a humble sawmill operator who started racing as a hobby, but he was so talented that he became a NASCAR superstar, placing first in 1951, second in 1952, first again in 1953, and second again in 1954 in a competition we now call the NASCAR Cup Series. A millionaire sponsor named Carl Kiekefer noticed Thomas and made him a member of his elite racing team. However, Kiekefer was ruthless and overbearing, and Herb Thomas quit Kiekefer's team in the middle of the 1956 season. He kept racing, though, and kept winning, poised to become champion for a third time. Kiekefer wouldn't stand for this. He talked NASCAR into extending the season, giving his drivers a chance to beat Thomas. In October, Thomas had to face off against two Kiekefer drivers named Speedy Thompson and Buck Baker at a race in North Carolina. Kiekefer's duo took the lead, with Buck in first place and Speedy just behind. Thomas took third place behind Speedy, then overtook him. Suddenly, Speedy hit Thomas from behind, sending him spinning. He crashed into the fence as other drivers sped toward him, unable to stop in time. 
Thomas wound up at the bottom of a pileup as one car after another slammed into him. He never finished the race. He lay comatose in the hospital with a fractured skull while Baker took the trophy. Although Key Kafer's team won that day, angry fans and bad publicity pushed the greedy sponsor out of racing. Herb Thomas returned to racing, but he wasn't the driver he used to be. He quickly retired and spent the rest of his life back at his sawmill. A few years later, the Hudson Motor Car Company went out of business. Both Herb and the Hornet faded from memory. Hey, Miss Sally, may I have this cruise? Of course, Mater. Americans were driving in record numbers. With traffic clogging up America's highways, including Route 66, Congress passed a new law. In 1956, they authorized another highway system, bigger and better than the one before, the interstate. The interstate would make driving more efficient, getting more people to more places in less time. But while adults prized efficiency, kids didn't. For teens, driving wasn't about speed, it was about style. And they built a whole ritual around it, cruising. Adults ruled the roads on weekdays, rushing to and from work on the crowded highway. But when the sun went down on Friday night, the drive-in theaters and restaurants of Main Street would activate their neon signs and the glowing colors gleamed off the polished bodies of cars carrying high schoolers to nowhere in particular. Boys and girls cruised around city blocks and through parking lots, admiring each other's cars, admiring each other, and occasionally challenging each other to races. Will you turn that disrespectful junk off? Respect the classics, man. It's Hendrix. Some teens who were cruisers in high school became hippies in college. They loved rock music, organic food, and, well, other things. I'm telling you, man, every third blink is slower. The 60s weren't good to you, were they? While cruisers liked sports cars, hippies knew the coolest car was the Volkswagen Microbus. Other cars were overpowered. The VW bus was underpowered. Other cars transported individuals. The VW bus transported groups. The bus could even convert into a camper, which made it ideal for trips to the beach or trips to rock concerts, like Woodstock. Hippies often added a splash of color to their vans, painting big peace signs and flowers on the panels. Fillmore is the ultimate hippie van. He's a VW bus with a taste for rock and roll, psychedelic colors, and of course, organic fuel. Low and slow. Oh yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah. Hippies weren't the only ones turning cars into art. In Southern California, for example, a young neo-Nazi weirdo called Von Dutch got famous painting intricate pinstripe art onto hot rods. You like old school pinstriping? Von Dutch style, huh? Oh. Oh, honey, look, Von Dutch. Oh. Uh, okay, no. But another group perfected car art. They were called lowriders. Many World War II vets return home with mechanical skills. White vets used these skills to make fast, growling hot rods. Mexican-American vets went in the opposite direction. They installed hydraulic systems that let their vehicles dance. They treated cars like canvases, painting dazzling colors and cultural symbols onto the car's bodies. Their favorite model was the Chevy Impala, which had wide, flat surfaces perfect for painting. Pixar's Chevy Impala, Ramon, embodies lowrider culture. He even recites the lowrider motto. Let's cruise, baby! Low and slow. Look at that. Look, and they're driving right by. They don't even know what they're missing. Throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s, Route 66 was booming. A steady stream of drivers crossed the country filling up at the Tower Station in Shamrock, Texas, taking in the views of Monument Valley, Arizona, and staying the night in Holbrook, Arizona's Wigwam Motel. Then, suddenly, traffic stopped. On September 22, 1978, 
barber Angel Delgadillo noticed things had changed in his hometown of Seligman, Arizona. One day there was so much traffic in Seligman it might take 15 minutes to cross the street. The next day you could lie down in the middle of the road and not worry about getting run over, he said. Remember that highway system the government approved back in 56? Well, it was making progress, and Interstate 40 had just opened, bypassing Seligman. Seligman businesses began closing, and neighbors began moving away. The same thing happened all along Route 66. Towns like Glen Rio became ghost towns. Others, like Peach Springs, stayed alive, but saw their stream of traffic slow to a trickle. In June 1985, transportation officials officially killed Route 66 and ordered all its highway signs taken down. While others left Seligman, Angel stayed put in the barber shop he'd inherited from his dad. It was a bitter time, though, and Angel resented the government for killing his once vibrant town. What he didn't realize was that while the government decommissioned Route 66, they couldn't truly kill it. After all, this was the road that once united East and West. It helped families escape the Dust Bowl. It had a theme song and a TV show. It was a slice of American history. And while it faded from memory, it didn't disappear entirely. A few drivers continued to pass through Seligman. They'd stop by Angel's shop, asking to hear stories about what things were like in the old days. And they gave Angel an idea. If people were treating Route 66 like a historic landmark, why not make it one? Angel embarked on a quest to make Route 66 a historic highway. He recruited 15 like-minded people, and they formed the Historic Route 66 Association of Arizona. Together, they campaigned to get the Arizona state government to recognize Route 66 as a historic site. In November 1987, the state granted their request. Towns like Seligman were back on the map. They may not attract the traffic they did before, but they would attract anyone curious to know the history of the old highway. In 2001, a whole group of curious travelers showed up at Angel's shop. They weren't historians or tourists, though. They were filmmakers, researching their next movie. Where am I? Where are you? Shoo! You're in Radiator Springs, the cutest little town in Carburetor County. Pixar chief John Lasseter had planned to make a car-themed movie for years, but it proved a lot harder than he expected. In 1998, Pixar began working on a movie they called The Yellow Car, which told the story of the ugly duckling with cars instead of birds. However, the story turned out to be just too thin, so they scrapped the project. Years later, they tried again, this time with a story about a cocky race car. Animators studied everything they could about racing. They visited racetracks across the country to experience the sights, smells, and sounds of the speedway. They asked race car drivers to drive them around the track. They even consulted legendary racers like the fast-talking, chrome-loving Daryl Waltrip and Richard Petty, nicknamed the King because of his many victories on the track. Pixar rewarded both men with roles in the film. However, Pixar wanted to tell a story that was about more than just racing. What if the hotshot rookie racer got stranded outside his element? How would a spoiled, arrogant superstar fare in a sleepy town on old Route 66? To tell that story, the Pixar team needed to visit the Mother Road. They contacted historian Michael Wallace, who literally wrote the book on Route 66, and he took them on a tour through the quaint towns and odd monuments on what remained of the old highway. They rewarded him by giving him the role of sheriff in the film. Eventually, Wallace led Lassiter and his team to Angel's Barbershop. Lassiter visited with Angel and later said that he was the single most inspirational person they met on their journey. But he wasn't the only person who inspired them. They also met a girl who'd left city life to run an Oklahoma cafe, and she inspired Sally. They also met a die-hard racing fan in Charlotte named Mater, who inspired a certain tow truck. So now how'd you get that name? Well, when I was a little old fella, I was raised up on the farm, and if I wasn't eating a tomato, I was gonna throw them at the hogs and just terrorize and everything I could. After many trips around the country, animators used the places and people that they'd seen to create the world of their film. Monument Valley, Arizona became Ornament Valley. Shamrock, Texas's You Drop In became Ramon's House of Body Art. The Midpoint Cafe in Adrian, Texas became Flo's V8 Cafe. 
the Blue Swallow Motel and TP Curio Shop of Tucumcari, New Mexico, and the Wigwam Village Motel in Holbrook, Arizona, became Sally's Cozy Cone Motel, with traffic cones taking the place of cement teepees. Animators even inserted the odd jackrabbit billboards they saw into their imaginary town of Radiator Springs. When the movie finally debuted in the summer of 2006, it became a hit. It spawned a whole franchise that now includes two sequels, a series of short films, a TV show, two spin-off films, and numerous video games. IndieWire reports that of all movie franchises, Cars is second only to Star Wars in toy selling power, having earned $10 billion in merchandise sales. In 2012, Disneyland opened Cars Land in California Adventure, which allows guests to walk through the world of Radiator Springs and experience shops, rides, and eateries inspired by the ones of Route 66. However, as fun as Cars Land is, for many travelers, there's nothing like the real thing. Cars brought new life to Route 66, and tourists flocked to the sites that inspired Radiator Springs. They weren't disappointed. Stop by the Cars on the Route filling station in Galena, Kansas today, and you'll see antique cars with cartoon eyes in their windshields, saluting the movie that made them a tourist destination. You'd think that interest in the highway would wane after a few years, but over a decade after Cars debuted, the tourists are still coming today. Then again, why wouldn't people flock to these towns? After all, history fascinates people, and Cars was a major historical film. It tells the story of America and the automobile, and that's a story of change, triumph, tragedy, grief, and humor, and it's one that's still unfolding today. No one knows for sure what the end of that story will be, but thanks to people like Angel Delgadillo and Michael Wallace and others, we know what the story has been so far. And sometimes, that's all you need. Because sometimes, as Mater says, Just need to know where I've been. So, there you have it. That is the history behind Disney and Pixar's Cars. This was a new format for me, a new type of video that I've never done before, so please do me a favor, let me know in the comments what you thought of it and whether you'd like to see more videos like this one. Also, while you're at it, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, follow me on social media. And as always, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.